Hit them where it hurts. Now, that's an idea. My guest today, Rachel Bittekoffer, is a political scientist and election forecaster, also a political strategist who's worked within the Democratic Party with candidates and organizations that implement actual negative partisan strategy, uh, strategies um, in the 2022 midterms that had great success. She is the author of the new book, Hit Him Where It Hurts, How to Save Democracy by Beating Republicans at Their Own Game. It's beating the MAGA folks, guys like me. You don't want to beat up on little old me. I'm a nice guy. We're going to talk to Rachel and her book. Coming back right after this. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. I'm glad you could be in the house today. And boy, do we have someone who wants to throw some elbows and do some knockdown. Rachel Bittacoffer, you <laughs> know her, you love her, you've seen her. She's got a great new book out that we're definitely going to get into. Hit him, hit him where it hurts. I love it. Because that's what you need to do. Hit him where it hurts. Uh, how to save democracy by beating Republicans at their own uh game um and here i've i've actually invited my friend on to talk about how she can beat us <laughs> but of course this is this is not to say that my team don't need some some whoop ass right now because of, because of some of the stuff they're doing so rachel welcome it's good to have you back yeah never forget michael i mean really at the end of the day I, my goal was to beat maga strangle it out of your party and return the party back to you saying fine folks so you know really it's we're, it's all about the collective good, you know? Yeah, no, we we're, <laughs> we're, we're appreciate that very much. So uh, this is a work that quite honestly, and, and for full disclosure, Rachel and I have talked about for a while um, before she started writing it. She shared the thoughts about how to sort of do two things. One, to, uh, and most importantly, wake up her own party to the reality that they were getting their asses handed to them at every election turn. Uh, and two, um, to to redefine the the landscape in favor of democratic ideals and norms and and policies through a political process. So, so this this work is is very much in that vein. Um, you 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 lay out in so many ways um, uh, the strategy that has been, I think, sort of lacking. In the, in the Democrats' approach to politics. So let's start with some basic rule or understanding about how Democrats approach the process. It, it's been one where, from my perspective, they, they like to start with a policy discussion and Republicans like to start with a slap upside the head. <laughs> yeah, that's a generous way to, to describe it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, so it really comes down to this. Like once upon a time, there was a great flux of American voters, okay? Because we had segregation happen in the South, triggering what we call the Dixiecrat Revolution. You know, at one point, as, as Republican dominated as the South is, it was equally dominated under the Democratic Party. So right. we had this period of time where there was a lot of potential to kind of find a median policy that's popular pitch it to voters and try to bring swing voters into your camp. And that's, I mean, really, frankly, kind of how politics rolled with some, you know, evolutionary steps, especially on the Republican side, until about the 2004 election, when Karl Rove, the brilliant strategist, you know, Karl Rove, because you, know, you don't have to like him to know that he came up with a good strategy, was like, hey, you know what would be better? Instead of telling swing voters we're going to do this and that and blah, 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 let's tell them that if we, they don't vote for us, vote for Republicans, Democrats are going to make gay marriage legal everywhere. Now, you might think, well, isn't that popular, Rachel? But no. No, <laughs> no it's it not. It's not. <laughs> in fact, it passed in all 11 states they put that ballot initiative on, and uh, including Oregon, you know, very liberal state. So with that, as, and you guys probably don't know this, it's not like you sat down and wrote this, like, this is what we're going to do. But over time, the Republican system evolved to when your chairmanship became. And the, the strategy was like, OK, well, let's run this congressional midterm as a referendum on Obama and Obamacare. Right. 
And and then middle class pitch or the swing voter pitches is, is about saving America from government overreach and Obamacare. It's about firing Pelosi so they can rein in Obama's socialist agenda, right? Right. And, and that's a very distinct strategy because the way that Democrats do it is they try to tell the swing voter, hey, swing voter, you should vote for me over my opponent because I'm going to be bipartisan. I'm going to be moderate. I get things done. I'm going to deliver results. And I'm a, you know, ex-sheriff and I ride a motorcycle or I'm an ex-Air Force fighter pilot and I fly a plane, right? It's right. all about bio, right? And of course, like, you know, both sides do bio ads, but only Democrats construct a whole strategy around selling this independent, moderate-minded swing, you know, Democrat to the electorate. And, and what Republicans do, I think is a really great testament to uh, an ad Trump just released today that shows it, it's all about, you know, the migrants in New York City, where I am now, that got released and the invasion of the border, which they're, you know, purposely causing to go on. But it, it's, a, it's an ad that's that does a twofold strategy. It drives Republican base voters and they're independent leaners, independents who admit that they lean Republican to turn out and show up in the election while simultaneously telling swing voters, don't buy the Democrats. It's a bad product. It's a scary product. They're ruining America. Right. They're going to get you killed. OK, that is a very distinctive persuasion strategy. And, you know, if I had to say there's a like, what's, what's the bare bones of the book about it's about getting Democrats to stop doing a bucket of moderate of persuasion advertising, a bucket of red meat stuff, you know, divided between 15 coalitions, you know, here and there. You know, de Republicans are reaching out to Latino voters. They're not trying to micro target them by eight different dialects. What they're trying to do is just target them at all because it's extraordinarily expensive to do voter outreach, as you know. And so they deliver one message. The Democrats are scary. Right. And the refrain of that might be. For crime, might be invasion rhetoric, it might be socialism, health care, whatever it is, but it's always Democrats are scary. And so it taps into something called negative partisanship, which is what I, you know, and my academic career really led me to here um, defining, which is how the, the emotions that we feel in response to the opposition party, which are enhanced when the opposition party is in a position to exert control over us. So the out party tends to have a lot of negative partisanship, but also it's just a feature of the of the system that we have that is hyper polarized and very tribal. Right. So so is is that is that sort of the what you refer to as the midterm effect? Is that or is that different from from what what you just described, because it sounds like that's sort of what you describe is more of a sort of a okay he, here's where how the earth is shaped and, and these are how the players are playing these are some of the things that they need to think about and, and consider as they play the game certainly what I did when I came in as RNC chairman given that I had such a disadvantage coming into this I'm sitting first off with Barack Obama breathing heavily over my shoulder and everything I did. We just lost 08, we just lost 06. Um, so we were a party without messaging, with without a orientation towards core values um, and, and really no way to sort of reframe narratives for voters. So I took a rather uh, grassroots approach. It was sort of bottom up thinking that said, well, People know, I mean, yeah, all politics is local until it isn't. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> and, and so we basically made the effort um, around nationalizing um, uh, uh, through Obamacare, yeah. local races, uh, local candidates. And by local, I mean governors i mean that's that's yeah. local right and and so State legislators and too, right? you know legislatures county executives yep. sheriffs uh, yep. <laughs> who hold those elective offices <laughs> right you know and and the goal was to say look you, you know everything everything sort of runs up to the federal government but you can control that spigot you can control that flow you can control the outcomes by the people you elect Congress, you create the Congress by the members you send. That's part of a, redistrict, a redistricting strategy, which, you know, I, I thought was a smart strategy to to use that I learned from Democrats in Maryland, by the way. Yeah. Um, so, 
um, it, you know, you you see this sort of shifting of the game. What I found interesting, having at that time, understandably more then than certainly now, was Democrats didn't shift with the game. They right. continued to play the same old traditional yeah. game while we went from checkers to chess. Yes. Now we're doing chess on a three-dimensional, five-dimensional level. You really are, right? Yeah, exactly. God, I could not have put that better. Right? <laughs> like <laughs> we miss, I mean, the, the transition happens, we don't change, okay? We get shellacked in the 2014 midterms. We underperform in 2016. Miracle of all miracles, Donald Trump is in office and we have negative partisanship. 18, I can sleep at night because there, there's no way Democrats can lose, okay? It doesn't matter what they do what strategy and how inept it is articulated. And they, they feel really good about the, the healthcare strategy. And it does tap into negative partisanship. So it's not devoid of that. But at the end of the day, what helped Democrats in 18 was fundamentals. And in 2022, okay, 2020 mm -hmm. as well, not 2022. That's important because when we get to that 2022 cycle, that fundamental was going to shift, that we were going to be the in party, the Republicans would be the out party, they would have a massive enthusiasm and negative partisanship benefit from that. And the midterm effect would evolve from that midterm effect is both that the base that's out of power is going to be more energized because they're getting affronted every day with a presidential actions that they don't like. But it's also powered by just most people don't follow politics. They aren't reading news every day. They like right. celebrity stuff, NASCAR, sports. Our algorithms are completely like freakazoid. Nobody's algorithms like yours and mine, Michael, right? right. Normal people, it's Kim Kardashian and Tom Brady and, and sports stars. It's not politics. And so what happens with that that midterm effect is that the that imagistic jury of the swing voter comes in against the incumbent and so that's what we knew we were going to be up against and i knew we were going to be up against early like you know the day well you got it right in 18 one. you you i remember yeah. the first time the first time i fell in love with rachel bittercoffer was the 2018 cycle in which i'm watching i'm reading what you're putting out on social media and a, a couple of platforms that you were associated with at the time and I was sitting there, and, and it's almost a little bit like um, Simon Rosenberg, uh, the Democratic pollster, who people, you know, who think they know better, uh, tend to disregard or sideline side a little bit or poo-poo today. Um, right, right. You were in that space then when you were yes. you were sitting there going, uh, "Time out." There's this going to be an enormous blue rave that's going to change the landscape politically. And all of the pros from 538 on up and down were like, well, who's this woman thinks she is? She don't know better than <laughs> us. And I'm sitting there reading what you're writing and going, well, hell, that lines up with how I'm seeing this. Um, so you Which means it's naturally better, right? If it's aligned with Michael Steele. Well, right? no, no, <laughs> but it, no, I, I was aligned with Rachel. Uh, and, yes. and, and it said, and it, but it, but is that, the thing that I think I want people to understand when you hear someone like Rachel or myself um, and a handful of others talk about elections is that we can throw numbers. And Rachel just went through some of the statistical stuff and some of the mechanics. And I'm going to talk to her a little bit about the infrastructure of, of the body politic um, that she talks about in her book. Um but the other thing that you have to understand that that folks like her bring to the table is this little thing called instinct, where you're so connected to the pipeline of voters that you're picking up a sixth sense about where voters are going. You, you know them well enough to know that they're going to get to the end of the block and they're going to stop or they're gonna to get to the end of the block and they're gonna cross the street, or they're gonna to get to the end of the block and they're gonna turn and go around the corner, right? Right. Everybody else is predicting, oh, when they get to the end of the block, they're just gonna keep going straight. And you're sitting there going, no, when they get to the end of the block, they're gonna cross the street. <laughs> they're, 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 they're not going straight. They're not continuing into the next block. Um, and and so they, you know, it's just one of those things that 
I, I think you you sort of elevated up in the game in 2018. How do you see that that element, that aspect of what you're what you've written um, as sort of a, a thread that people need to hold on to because it'll help you better understand what you're looking at right now. That if you, oh, if you sort of buy yeah. into the instinct of the person who's doing the analysis and just get get just get a milliliter behind the numbers to understand where that's coming from. Yeah, that's good, good. I'm really glad you're asking about that. So the, what I do in the first half of the book is I try to bring the reader, you know, whoever's listening to this, to my head, a trained political scientist with a PhD in political behavior, voter psychology, campaigns and elections. I've studied them systemically, which is different than a practitioner might study a system. It's a you know very different way of approach. And so bringing people in to understand like, when I'm watching a lot of election analysis, it's because it's not like law. When when something happens in the court, the experts, they call the legal experts. Right? Right. But like everyone's kind of assumed to be an election expert because we're all watching the events, right? We all are well-versed in the history. So when they bring the experts in, sometimes I'm listening. And I'm like, no, that's not how any of this works. And so the first half of the book is about getting all of everybody that's reading it to understand how political scientists at rigorous academic quantitative research, what it tells us about the electorate that we're trying to move, okay? And that's so important because once I do that, people understand, oh, okay, right away you take out half of the voting age eligible population every year, right. even the fewest ones, okay? Half of Americans are not even going to show up to vote, right? And then you get into that, that bucket of people who do vote and it's about getting people to understand the reason my forecast was so brilliant, right? That it took me, you know, Nate Silver and Wasserman by surprise is because it understands that I don't need to know anything else about a, a person, a voter. I don't need to know if they're a man or a woman, black, white, young, old, college educated or not. Those things are helpful to know because it helps me model the next thing, the most important thing that I need to know, which is partisanship. Do they have a preference for a party and they might be admitted right i'm a democrat i'm a republican but in that 30 percent, 35 percent of the pool that claims to be independent most of them are not actually independent and when you probe them they will admit i tend to vote for republicans i tend to vote for democrats and we call those people's people leaners okay and that's important to understand folks because what it means is that Basically, partisanship, me just knowing Michael Steele's an independent who leans Republican, nine out of 10 times I can pick, I will be able to pick who you're going to vote for just on that. That's all I need to know. Right, and, right. And so, and so partisanship has always been like that. It's always been a powerful heuristic, but in polarization, it has become much, much, much more powerful. And we have an electioneering analysis system and certainly an electioneering strategy system until recently on the left that almost that completely ignores the reality that at the end of the day, the voter will show up and pick up a ballot and it's going to have a D and an R on it. OK, so you can't hide partisanship from a, you know, a, 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 most elections are partisan. There are nonpartisan as well, but you can't hide it from the voter. That means you have to sell them on the brand, on the right. party's brand, right? And so when you look at that Republican strategy, it's about painting all Democrats as Obama, Pelosi Democrats. Now it's squad Democrats. And it doesn't give quarter for nuance. So like this person voted for this, that person voted against Mariokas impeachment. They they would never care about that. They would just sell, just say, this guy is a radical Democrat. He's a socialist, and he wants to turn your male children into girls. Well, right? and so, <laughs> so, yeah. So, how does how does that then feeds into what you talk about um, uh, in in the book? Let me pull it. I was pulling it up. I was uh, wanted to focus on the the, the Heritage Foundational Political yes. Infrastructure. Talk to us about about that. Uh, how the Republican infrastructure is different from the democratic infra infrastructure as based on the heritage uh, political infrastructure. Yeah, I'm gonna describe that in just three simple words, Michael. Money, money, and money, okay? <laughs> like the Democrats- We good at grift, uh, I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> we gave it a new art like, form. <laughs> 
treat you okay with like the formal like organization fundraising comparing to you guys right. but once you get out of that man it's a, you know it's a bloodbath right and that's because Billionaires have a vested interest in investing in a conservative movement. They've invested in it for decades. They, there's an obvious return on investment, low taxes, low regulation. Okay. On the left, you have to, number one, you got two problems because in the Citizens United world, the base hates campaign finance and wants to unilaterally disarm, right? Same with gerrymandering. They don't, you know, Republicans, oh, it's all this corporate money. We're going to say no money. No, I'm not even going to take money from corporations. And I'm like, great, you're going to lose. Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, okay. That, that's you know like that's mean? like a discipline in perspective. That's like an <laughs> army saying, you know what? We just don't, we're so afraid. Of, we don't believe in guns that we're not using them. Okay. Yeah, we don't on. need any bullets. No bullets for us, no okay? Bullets. So like, no bullets. You know what I mean? So like, let alone are they saying what I want them to say, which is, dear billionaire, we only need one of you, okay? Because like that's how money works in this system. Actually, we really only just need one. And obviously Soros people are not it because they've been poorly investing now for 10 years, right? right. So we need one billionaire who's not George Soros to come in and build, start building this infrastructure out. And I lay out how much this infrastructure has, you know, it started in the 70s, and 80s, right? But really like ALEC is 2000, Red Map is 2000, the Federalist Society, Judicial Watch, all of this shit that has, and turning point, right? They, so we have 500 elbow grease, grassroots, young people led, you know, youth turnout operations. So they're all spit and gumballs, right? It's all right. like sweat and there's no one paid. There's no distribution budget. Charlie Kirk has a four office building complex in some of the most expensive, expensive real estate in Phoenix. Four buildings. One of them is called Turning Point Logistics. It's a whole building with four floors and it's called Turning Point Logistics. And I went down there to debate to see this infrastructure with him. And I mean, they hit $83 million coming out of Turning Point. And they're using it to host these, you know, they take them on summer camps and conventions to fabulous places. And, you know, they network out young conservatives right into the movement. You're meeting billionaires and Michael Steele and whoever, right? Well, they're like not the meeting me. Right? <laughs> Trust no, me. not meeting you. I am not, yeah, but you I know am what I mean? not like, on Charlie Kirk's hit parade. That's for sure. <laughs> that's right. I'm sure more, more like his hit list, but not his hit parade. That's for sure. Yeah. So we have, we have, we should be putting out a personal ad. On the SO, one billionaire who, along with being disgustingly rich and having yachts and all the shit you get as a billionaire, also wants other people to maybe have some freedom. <laughs> like, please right. invest. And the rest of us, so like, you know, you can dominate us economically, right? That's the plus side. So, you know, I, I think that it can happen, but I do think that we have to have hard conversations about how we're going to build and resource a movement that can take on the billionaire, multi-billion. I mean, they got 11 billionaires, I think, running in the GOP building various infrastructures if you if you were to map them all out so and it, and it's uh, the time to have started was 20 years ago i'm not the first person that has noticed federalist society judicial watch alec all these institutions getting built and then expanded and funded to the moon tune and millions and saying democrats need to do something democrats need to do something but i am the first one to say that's it just all we got to do is start we know we cannot build a thing that's going to match them out the gate but we that does not mean we should do nothing, right? <laughs> like we need to start so, so, you know, no, I, I building the infrastructure. All, I agree with all of that. But using using the 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 Charlie Kirk example, the I think one of the things that Democrats can do differently is to build something that is going to be sustainable long term long term. And by that I mean what I see with with Kirk, I mean, yeah, he's got one building generating eighty-three million dollars, right, et cetera. Well, what? How did the hell did that happen? And what? And what is it connected to? Because if it's connected to an anti-democratic principle or idea, how long will it sustain itself? And I think this is one of the spaces where Democrats uh, fall down on themselves a little bit uh, and get lost in the weeds of policy and a few other things. The idea is to build this network out in a way that it is sustainable long-term that you're expanding. And so it's it's not just tied to a specific policy, but a set of ideas. And this is what this is what you see on the right is 
it's not tied to a policy. There's nothing that's come right. out of MAGA that's policy oriented. Not even right. build the wall is policy oriented because guess what? When they had the chance to do it, they couldn't build the wall. Yep, right? exactly. But a whole lot of people made money off of it. Right. A whole lot of organizations grew up around it, including yep. uh, USPA or PCA, or whatever the hell that is. Um, so the so the reality of it is, how do the Democrats create a structure in which that billionaire that you talk about is actually building something that is dynamic enough to continue to expand uh, the policy piece that everyone likes to talk about, but more importantly, that thing that's linked to the democracy, that's linked to you know uh, the rule of law, those intangible elements that people at the end of the day may fall off the democratic wagon on healthcare, for example, but stay right. linked linked to that wagon because it it is the party that ascribes and believes very much into uh, the constitutional norms. No, I think I mean think that's right. Like so, what, what I keep trying to tell people about the messaging work I've been doing for the for the first couple of years. Some of it's paid, some of it's pro bono. I'm trying to fix as much as we I can so we don't all die, right? But one of the things that I've been explaining, especially in the grassroots orbit is like, look, it doesn't matter if your issue is climate change or gun reform or, you know, health care or whatever it might be in that democratic, you know, women's rights, whatever. It, it's it, At the end of the day, it's about freedom, right? It's about your freedom and it's about your health, wealth, safety and security, right? So you can, you can take these wonky buckets of policy that seem very segmented and you can tie them under that banner of freedom, and democracy and rule of law and good government, right? right? And so, like to me, that's what I'm trying to do is build a, a glue, an ideological glue for a party that's never really had that before. It's always been about interest-based, group-based, you know, by you know, multi-curated buckets of people who are working on specific things. And you got to build. I, you have to build a strategic framework for the messaging for 2024. I call it the one ring that binds them all, right? Mm -hmm. It's that freedom. This is a threat. The, the Republican Party is an existential threat now to democracy, the rule of law, right? And that means climate change wise, the earth is going to burn. That means with gay rights, they're going to start, you know, uh, rounding up trans people probably the way right. that they talk, right? With immigration, they're they're planning on you know rounding up every brown person they can find in Arizona and Texas, as far as I can tell from their you know the right wing shows that I've been watching. So it's about getting Democrats kind of take a step back from those the the end product, the policy, and understand how that ideological co that that shared ideology. Uh, ideological frame to umbrella all of this by you know what seems to be divergent interests right but they really are under this umbrella so that's what i'm working on now that's that that's not a little bit <laughs> that's a lot <laughs> well always dude this, this plan was always not i've always been very clear to people like it's 2021 winter, right? They've underperformed down ballot. The midterm effect is coming. I'm a political scientist. It's like the Terminator. You can't, you can't beg it away. You can't, you know, borrow it away. You can't run from it. The midterm effect is coming in 2022. And I have to get Democrats to completely change how they do electioneering, right? And I, I would tell people I'm there's no way to do that, but also there's no way not to try because if we do not do that. They are going to take control of the Midwest in 2022, and they may use that control of those governorships, especially to thwart a good and free, fair election in 2024. So, you know, it's always been about, can I do something that's impossible because we have to do it? And, and you know, I haven't done it alone. It's It's been, you know, this big orbit, like I call team reform, team America, team democracy of groups, people, individuals from the top, from the bottom all coming together right. it's taken michael beckloff and and you know um oh, oh my gosh um the sultan john meacham right. to be willing to say you know to come be, because they because they're academics too and i know because i'm an i was an academic getting into the weeds of partisanship is the opposite of everything an academic is trained to do so the fact that meacham was willing to do that and say this is fascism this stuff that's happening our democracy is under threat, and it's not under threat from politicians or 
Congress, right, which is what we tend to like to say, it's under threat from name the villain Republicans, right? So it's been very helpful to have people like you and others saying, no, this is a problem. Like this, we can all right, see this happening. Right. They tried to overthrow the government, you know? So we've so. got we, we're we're talking with Rachel Bittercoffer, the the author of the hot new book released, uh, "Hit Them Where It Hurts: How to Save Democracy by Beating Republicans at Their Own Game." Uh, when we come back after a short break, I want to get into communication, which I think is a nightmare for Democrats, and let's find out how Rachel helps them solve some of those problems. We'll have more with Rachel right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele podcast. We are having a lot of fun with my friend Rachel Bittercoffer, the author of the new book, Hit Him Where It Hurts. And she does. Yes, she hits him where it hurts. Uh, oh, yeah. As, when as I heard you say recently. Uh, yeah, yeah, as I heard they you go say, low, you got to hit them. That's what I'm saying. As I heard you say recently, when they go low, hit them. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> like, oh, snap. Okay, is that yeah, what you're doing now? Yeah, so, thanks for the <laughs> thanks, yeah, buddy. No, I'm no, coming so, for you. <laughs> so let's talk about communication because a big part of what uh, uh, ails the Democrats and Republicans are very good at is communicating a message. Um, we're very good at communicating a very negative message. Democrats are very poor at communicating a hopeful message. And that's that's a sad thing to say in many respects, because I think it really speaks to what the consumer actually will consume. And it, you see it not just played it played out in how people uh, respond to news and information. You know, the whole idea, if it bleeds, it leads. Right. And so people tend to want to see the car crash. They, they want to. They want to see the, the the gory details, but the media and and social media platforms also uh, play in that space where they they are much more interested in telling the story of the underbelly of a thing than telling the story of the sun that shines on that very thing. How how did the communications of the two parties affect how voters approach? and are approaching this upcoming election? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, right? I mean, I think we've never really seen Denver. I mean, in 22, we saw some some uh, specific races run in a posture, the negative partisanship style posture, right? Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan, especially, right. and in Arizona, where Adrian Fontes, the Secretary of State candidate down there, wedged protecting democracy to, to win that race, right? So, you know, when I, when we think about, you know, how the two parties are, are, are at the end of the day, I think Democrats have to be, have to be careful with the optimism message because if you're focusing too much right now on optimism, it creates kind of like a Jekyll and Hyde, right? So on one level, you're telling me we're in this moment of crisis. It's existential. We got to go do this, da, 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 da. If we don't, everyone's going to die. But at the same time, you're telling me, you know, I have an education policy of this and that, or, you know, we're going to pass you know, um, Medicare for all, right? right. I mean, like we don't have a functional government right now. We can't deliver, well, there's no deliverable that you can bring to the electorate until we fix the crisis in the Republican party. And I think it causes kind of this, this diaspora, right? That's like confusion of the voter. Like, well, which is it? Am I, should I be concerned about grocery prices or being able to vote again? Or should I be concerned about how much, you know, um, you know, ga uh, gas cost, or should I be concerned that if I don't vote, Republicans are going to pass a national abortion ban, right? And I, and I, so I, th though I do think there is an importance, and a, and for Biden in particular, a real, real benefit if it's going to be Doctor Doom, Trump is all, all doom, right? All right. Um, uh, American carnage. It's going to be American carnage, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week for however long this thing endures, right? And I do think that Biden, along with the, hey, this is the threat, has to offer a really a Reagan-like, it's morning in America again vision. And I've been counting on the economic, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm I'm good at predicting ec economics, but apparently I'm better than these people are, okay? Because right. I, for months, <laughs> knew there wasn't going to be a recession like nine months ago, right? Let alone 
nail the soft landing stuff, which I started looking at a few months ago, you know, with with uh, the economy, it's going to be, I think we're going to be looking at summer and fall headlines about rate cuts, booming economy, strong GDP growth. And I think that Biden needs to be able to say to the electorate, look, things are going so good. I mean, it really will not be a lie to say, are you better off now than you were four years ago? It was a lie in 2023. It, you know, it wasn't a lie. I mean, voters would have seen it was it a difficult a argument to make. It was a difficult argument yeah. to make. But now we're coming into this thing. And so obviously, I'm not saying he should literally say it's morning in America. But I do think that in this existential crisis moment, he has to make a pitch to people as to why they should see choosing democracy as leading to the right outcome. And, and they have he's going to have to paint the other side of the hill in that messaging um, framework to do that. And I think right. it's so, so talking about painting, you, you note in the book um, and you talk about messaging um, into breaking it down into seven steps. Um, and, I, and I want you to speak to those, but I, I want to draw out one of the things that you, you know to say, quote, here are two truths that many Americans simply will not believe, thanks to the GOP's success in branding Democrats and themselves. Today, the Democratic Party is the only political party truly fighting for and preserving American freedom. Though it brands itself with patriotic images and language, today's Republican Party hates freedom. They want fascism. Democrats must take back that most powerful, the most powerful F word in American politics by rebranding themselves as the party of freedom and the Republicans as the party of fascism. That is part of your one of the steps that you outline, the first being ride, ride for the brand, what I just described, rebrand both party with F words, less defense, more counter offense, take credit, give blame, own your issues, then own theirs, stick to a single villain, say it again and again and again. What you described there is largely what I did in 2010. Yes, um, <laughs> it's not original. Like, I really developed it all. As I told you in the first interview when I was all starry-eyed, starstruck new, Michael Steele, oh my God, like I study campaigns. I have that effect on people, by the way. They just, they, they just go, oh my God, Michael Steele. No. <laughs> but I learned and they run one, the other way. 2010 strategy. Because I remember thinking, dude, and you and I remember this. I mean, the economy was on fire, right? Like the Republican Party comes in, they get this giant quagmire in Iraq. And then they take a giant shit on the economy yeah. while they're in charge. Yeah. And, the, and the Republicans are like, oh, my God, we're going to be locked out like the FDR time period. It's going to take us 30 years to control. Con I mean, remember the conversation? Oh, yeah, very and then much yet, so. You know, 16 months later, they pick up 63 seats in the yeah. house. And I was my yeah. first and year I of can graduate take, school. I can <laughs> so tell I you how like, many people did not want this. to invest in my strategy. <laughs> they they did not believe uh, that that was doable. In fact, I remember an op-ed that Karl Rove had written in like February of uh, 2010 with his projection that Republicans would be lucky to pick up 39 seats or some some dumbass statement like that. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. And I was sitting there going, all right, dude, whatever. Oh. Uh, okay, <laughs> 39, that's your number. Okay, got it. But that, that really is um, understanding how, and it goes back to what I was saying about instincts. My instincts at the time um, evolved around this, uh, this idea of how do I brand uh, or rebrand a party that has been branded as a loser uh, right. by its losses, has been branded um, as uh, you know, big government republicanism under Bush and all these other things. And it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, I'm I'm still a Bush stalwart today as I was then. Um, and really appreciated uh President George Bush's uh, both HW and W's uh, service uh, to the country. Um, but it was understanding where the where the field, how the field was shifting beneath our our feet how the base was moving. And of course, I had the the enormous pleasure of being welcomed by the Tea Party uh, yeah. in 2009. <laughs> um, so I, I had a real understanding. So this idea of riding the brand uh, and, and rebranding both parties. Now, I didn't need to rebrand 
uh, Democrats as fascists or, or or anything else. I just needed them. I just needed to brand them as intrusive. Right. That they that the they were trying to insert themselves in the guise of national health care between you and your right. doctor. So exactly. it's you and your daughter who are dealing with a very sensitive question, and the federal government now wants to step in and say, "Oh no, no, you have to do it this way, or you can't get that service." Because here's the irony, Rachel. Talk about you, and you you talk about how the narrative has flipped and the script has moved into a different posture. What are Republicans doing today um, on abortion? They're exactly. inserting the government between a woman and her doctor, between exactly. a family, a parent and their daughter, and making the decision for them grotesquely, aggressively, and in violation of their constitutional right of self-determination, right? Yep. Uh, by saying to them, not only if you leave the state for an abortion, but if you come back, you and everyone else in the chain are going to be subject to criminal prosecution. So you you see how the party has moved off of its original branding, that, right? You know, narratively put it on the right side of the American voter to this new branding that has it outside. So the branding piece is important. Less defense, more counter offense. I can't even begin to tell you. You know, get out of the get out of the the crouch posture and throw a few Yosha. punches, take yeah, credit, yeah. give blame, all of that. So yeah, I mean, you you spelled it out. So are the Democrats listening? Oh yeah, I think they are. I mean, I think the results speak for themselves, right? So twenty twenty two was a it was it was it was both a, a major victory, but also disappointing because it could have been everywhere, and if it had been everywhere. People like J.D. Vance would not be sitting in the Senate right now. Right. J.D. Vance, he is an out and out sexist. He's a very fascist. He's, you know, be, just went on national TV and said, you know, from now on Republican state legislatures will decide who wins elections. <laughs> right? Like he is a raging extremist. And Ohio never once heard that about him. Never once. I mean, barely, barely, maybe a little here and there, because because Tim Ryan was running that old strategy of. I'm Tim Ryan. I'm bipartisan. I'm not one of those Democrats, which, of course, if you are um, a Republican, you love that message from Democrats, the what I call apologetic Democratic message, right. because Republicans are saying, don't trust Rachel Biddecoffer. She's a Democrat and Democrats are evil. And then I'm saying, well, I'm not really one of those Democrats. I'm affirming the premise. Right. There is right. something wrong. With but, and what, but what and that's they, the brand. Right? But what they lose sight yeah. of in that in that is that doesn't mean that those voters are going to vote for you. They like what you're yes, saying yeah. because they can point to you and, and now there's a reason not to vote for you. You're still a Democrat. That's what they failed to understand. You're still a Democrat yeah. in the eyes and of those voters. And that D is on the ballot. You cannot evade it. Right? Right. Like, right. it is so you got to make the it's case for your own. Yeah. Right. You have to make, and you have to write about, you have to do the brand, right? So like, you know, like I, I, we're learning to putt. There's a lot of change. The Biden campaign is the least of, I'm concerned about them least because they're really embracing things and, and it's rolling and they're doing it correctly. But it's the swing map down ballot that I'm I am so keen to see, not just some of those critical house races, especially those 18 very vulnerable Republicans serving in districts that Biden won, what we call Biden districts. Um, and on the Senate map, this cycle in particular is, is the opposite of 22. 22 was there's no way you keep the house. What you try to do is keep it as low as possible, right? And the Senate was winnable. It's the opposite in 2024. And our path to a Senate majority cannot happen without winning either Texas or Florida. Okay. And it and it and it just boggles my mind that we that we have somebody like Rick Scott down in Florida and we're gonna run a candidate about how great Debbie Marcel Powell is. No, let's go down and tell Florida. <laughs> Especially in the villages, this guy is the architect of the of the steal your social security plan, right? Steal your social security plan. Say that. Don't say they're going to cut it. They're not going to sunset it. They're not going to you know take it on to dinner and and a, and a drink. Okay, just say steal. They're going to steal your money, not their money, not old people's money, not other people's money. You voters' money, right? Because we. we we're humans and we're we're very self-focused, right? Even right. When no, they are. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's yeah. Very so like, personal. you know, 
Yeah, like, so I, you know, when you're appealing to voters and you want them to care about out groups, well, guess who cares about out groups? It's the liberal base of the Democratic Party. And, and that's basically it. <laughs> Most people love the in group. Even liberals are very tribal in the human psychology realm. They're still on the bell curve of, of that, of self interest. So it's very important that these, these, this language, and, and I, I love that you mentioned the big gov frame because you're right that brand you guys hammered for 30 years 40 years and and it's it's so powerful that when in political science we would always talk about the difference between policy preference and ideological like median voter preference because when you ask voters they like limited government deregulation all the things you guys have made very popular but then they like policies that are the opposite of those things right, right? So operational right. versus right. symbolic well, know? and, and, a, good and, example, and a good example a good example that is is the debate of uh, is the obamacare the argument that you right. don't want the government between you and your doctor uh won the day in 2010 uh, no today, doubt. they're very happy to have the government between them and their doctor. <laughs> and I'm very happy to take your 40 years of priming the pump on limited government, and I'm going to co-opt it. I mean, we've already done that. I, I didn't have a hand in the Kansas race, um, but you know, the strategy was pitch perfect. Is exactly what I would have done, right? And what did they do? They told Kansas the voters is exactly this. Hey, voters who've already been primed and branded to hate big government overreach, the government's trying to get between you and your doctor. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's it. Right? The argument yeah. works. So, and it, and we're going to work it again. We're going to run it in Texas. We're going to run it in Florida. We're going to run it everywhere where you guys have been padding this perception that government, limited government is good. So let's use all that investment you guys have done for us, but just make sure we flip the villain around now and, and that it becomes the Republican Party. So, so before I let you get up out of here, here we sit in February of 2024. Presidential election is in November. There's all kinds of shit and bullshit that's out there uh, <laughs> coming from Trump and MAGA. They they have taken, I don't know what the hell they doing, they're doing, but one thing I do know they can't do is math um, or to count <laughs> votes because we've watched the Speaker of the House uh, lose on three very important uh, matters related to the border, related to the Mallorca's yeah. uh, impeachment. Um, and the reality is, that at one level you have polling that shows Trump ahead of his with Hispanic voters by 1.4241 over Biden, um, having made significant gains in, in in a very important battleground state like Nevada, which is going right. to be in play in November, which likely Trump could would win. Um, and uh, in national polling out by NBC News uh, this past weekend. Uh, Biden is losing to Trump right. um, with all, and again, the shit and the bullshit that he's, he's, he's carrying and pushes out to the American people, they're buying it. They're yeah. buying it. And then some of it goes to what we were saying before about how folks um, are selfish. And I've been saying this on this podcast for a while, American, the American, this generation of Americans are selfish as hell. Um, yeah. They look at their neighbors as other. They don't give a shit if they see them lying in the street. In fact, they'll probably go over and kick them in many cases because they're not from the neighborhood. And I give you that uh, examples of, you know, young uh, men who go uh, carrying AR, uh, AR-15s into uh, neighborhoods and communities, not their own, kill someone, leave. And everyone's like, OK, that's that's fine. Um, and yeah. now I've simplified the argument and for for effect for sure. But the the truth of it is that there are a lot of dynamics at play uh, going on out amongst the American people. As we sit here right now, I'm not asking you to project who's going to win or anything like that because I, I think you're going to be good at that math um, as we get closer to September October. Definitely. How do you see? what you've written and how you've laid out um, uh, playing out over the next six months or so for right. Democrats and Republicans as they try to shape the landscape for what will be a very bitter fight in November. Yeah, so I and I put this out on my my um, blog. I wrote a, a episode in December because people were so angsty 
about the polling, you know, and I was like, people are going to ruin their Christmas and I need everyone to be energized for the next right, 11 months. Right, so right. let me just tell you guys what I'm going to, was planning to tell you later, right? Like I, I'll tell you again with more detail, but right now, let me just tell you. Okay. And so what I did, and I, I stole Nate Silver's like book title that he wrote after his 08 forecast, the signal and the noise. And I did that because Nate Silver steals all my shit and never tells anyone about me. So I think it's fair. Right. right. So what I try to tell people is, like because polling, number one, polling has gotten harder and and less response rate, less represented, bottom line, right, over the years. But the other issue with polling is that there's so many players in the game because it's such clickbait, gener it generates clicks very well. So many, many people have gotten into the game of polling. It is uh, very subject to methodological preference. So right. like how you weigh it, how many co non-college educated voters, what do you think the electorate will look like? And so it can, it can make it noisy. And so what I was trying to tell people is this, like, look, here's what matters. I'm going to tell you guys, if we look back from 20, after the 2021 gubernatorial loss, which was the last time I was stuck on the sidelines screaming, let me play, right? right? After that loss, when you start, when you get into 2022, and I was like, oh, my God, how are we going to hold Arizona? How are we going to get Eric Infantes? Because he was running as an insurrectionist, an actual right. insurrectionist right. Right. to run the state voting system. Like, oh. And then the memo leaked, okay, the, the row reversal memo. And I was like, this is going, the, the pandemic didn't do it. None of this shit would ever do it. You know, people think like little things, but like. Row to me, I knew, I mean, I'm a woman, right? But I knew, like, what happens is the morality is always, it's, it's going to flip. And it's always favored life <laughs> because it's right. always been about hypothetical children. And, you know, when it's hypothetical, they're always beautiful, blonde hair, blue eyed, white babies. And they, they're cherubic and they'd have great lives if only we selfish women wouldn't murder them in the womb. Right. right? But like in a world where you're post row and you had all this cascading Republican state legislation to, to immediately enforce this anti-abortion agenda, the morality suddenly becomes about women again, right? It's never, it was never going to be about women until abortion was gone. And as soon as abortion was gone, it was going to become what we see now with these headlines of women that are being medically tortured by the state of Texas, right? So that morality game changer, I said, man, now we can win. We can win the whole thing. We may even be able to stop their whole house wave. And, you know, what we've seen since then, Michael, that was a wind up to explain like in data, here is like 2022, 2021, Roe gets repealed and Democratic overperformance goes up by eight points across the uh, across right. the board. Swing races, long shot races with no spending and no advertising on average is, has produced about an eight point improvement for Dems. And that improvement has lasted in every single election, including the 2022 cycle and the 2023 state legislative cycle right. in Virginia now. And, you know, we're going to see again, I'm sitting in New York's special election district right now, the Santos district, mm -hmm. and that's going to have a special. And, you know, every time we get some like tangible meat, like the state legislative cycle in Virginia, I'm like, that's it. I've seen enough, man. Democrats definitely have an edge going into 2024. And then after a few months, I'm like, okay, I need to see a new data point. So this special election and all the things that are coming, voter registration, fundraising, um, you know, things like that are going to tell us, but the hard data has been sending us a very clear signal. And it's the exact opposite of what polling has been telling us over that same time period. And so at the end of the day, I think people need to look for the signal. The signal is when we get into an elector electoral environment, when you're bringing voters in and subjecting them to campaign effects, who is winning that? And we so far have been winning that. Interesting, interesting. And that's why her work uh, is so uh, precise in so many ways, because you account for that aspect that a lot of the boys don't, to be honest, and just put it in those terms, a lot of the fellas don't. Um, and and they get jealous and they get frustrated by Rachel Bittacoffer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the best it. revenge of all, you know what I mean? I like, love it. I love it. Because you, you... I highly recommend if you're a revenge person and you need some revenge in your life, there is no better, no better revenge than success. Trust me. Yeah, no, that trust me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm still I'm, I'm just I'm still waiting there. 
waiting to see who can top 63 house seats. So anyway. No doubt, dude. I got to tell you, we can get through this little hurdle, though, man. I might be coming for that. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. All at right. The end of the day, I mean, my goal is, you know, we're going to return to a, a two-party system of, of basic moderation, right? We're fighting over, should tax rate be 33 or 37 percent right like right things like that, you know but like you know things are taken for a given we're not going to screw nato we're not going right. to help vladimir putin right like that's my life goal and so I, I do if you're listening to this show i know who you are like you're the never trump audience and you have hung with us so hard and i know it's so hard to break your tribe but we need you in this election cycle. You're probably one of our most important resources, especially in places like Georgia and Arizona. So please, please put democracy, vote D for democracy, okay? It's not about Democrats. It's not about helping any of us. It's about D for democracy. And I need you to do it from the top of the ballot all the way to the bottom. Well, I could, there it is. I There it is, Rachel <laughs> I Thank you so much for coming out and spending some time sharing some real important strategic insights about um, the infrastructure, the process, the, the communication around uh, election, the tribalism, uh, but most importantly, leaving us with the message about democracy, because at the end of the day, that's the end game, uh, is to yeah. preserve and protect and defend this, this wonderful idea that so many still are attracted to, even though some are in our neighborhoods, our communities, and even in our own families have lost sight of. So, Rachel, yeah, yeah. Thank I you. mean, you saw the 60 minutes, right? With the chat, like, they were showing how Chinese people are coming over the border hole. And, you know, I'm not saying that whether I like right. that or not. I'm just, but what did, when they asked the Chinese woman, why are you doing this? You're, you, they're doing it through TikTok and then coming right. from China all the way through the South American continent on land to come up here. And she had just one answer, Michael. It was one word, freedom. That's yeah. what she said, yeah. freedom, right? We have to protect it. It's it's very, very, very vulnerable right now. Enjoy, enjoy that F word because it's, it's yeah. an important one. It's an important word. <laughs> Rachel, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. Follow Rachel on X at Rachel Bittacoffer. Um, definitely do the download thing here, folks. We know you, I love it when you do. You make me feel all yummy inside. Uh, tell your friends about the podcast, share the love, but more importantly, go out and get a copy of Hidden Where It Hurts, How to Save Democracy by Beating Republicans at Their Own Game. It is a book I guarantee you will be taught at our universities um, in the future about how, how you do elections and how you change the game. And no better game changer than Rachel Bittercoffer. Thank you so much, Rachel. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you so much for everything. All right. Take care, folks. Until next time, be blessed, be uh, well. You too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>